We turn now to Joseph and trial. Early on in this dispensation, a revelation was given in which the prophet was addressed as follows. Be patient in afflictions, for thou shalt have many. At the end of his life, the prophet spoke in such words as these, I have become accustomed to swim in deep water. And elsewhere, for some strange reason, the envy and wrath of man have been my common lot throughout my life. But he added, every wave of adversity has only wafted me that much closer to divinity. A magnificent statement. Let's go back uh, to the beginning. We have Mother Smith's record. There were some over the last three decades who felt that since these recollections were dictated by the mother of the prophet in her late years and had been somewhat altered in the writing, that they were not reliable. A fellowship was given to Dr. Richard L. Anderson some three years ago to study the originals and compare them to the published, and the overall verdict, with two or three minor exceptions, the overall verdict is that Mother Smith is exceptionally reliable and that the names, the places, the dates, and the events that she chronicles can be confirmed in other sources. You have, said Father Smith to Mother Smith once in Kirtland, one of the most remarkable families in the world. And on that same occasion, Father Smith gave a blessing to each of his children. Again and again, those blessings prophesy as they also reflect the monumental struggle that the prophet and those around him would have to go through. In an early inquiry of the Lord pertaining to how the church was to be organized, it was the closing sentence, Be faithful, even if you should be slain. This is in 1829. The day the church was organized, both Joseph and Oliver are addressed with this counsel, and even if they do unto you as they have done unto me. Blessed are ye, for ye shall dwell with me in glory. In fact, the prophet once said, if you cannot endure persecution, and I quickly add that enduring isn't just going through, we most of us get through our trials, if that means merely survive in some basic way. But to endure in the Christ-like way is something more. Well, if you cannot endure persecution, said Joseph Smith, you cannot endure the glory of the celestial kingdom. Interesting test to apply to the saints. Many of you will yet be martyred for this work, he said as early as 1833, and one wonders if the long shadow of his own martyrdom was in his mind at that time. They did do unto him and his brothers as they had done unto the Lord. They fought, they vilified, they attacked. He was a threat to them, and they did all within their power to stop. Someone has observed that the worst difficulties that came to the early church arose from its clash with other organized religions. That, I think, is a half-truth. We did indeed suffer immensely from what could be called officialdom in the religious world. We suffered more 
in political and social ways. But by all odds, the most difficult and painful and hurtful to the Church of all the kinds of opposition was that which arose from apostates. The difficulty the ancient ministry of Christ faced was that one betrayed him from within. And so, in this modern dispensation. A conversation once occurred that I find extremely revealing between Joseph and a man named Behunan, a convert. He, this convert, had seen men who had been involved in the quorums and in the high spiritual experiences of the kingdom and then had become disaffected and then, which was the mystery, had devoted their zeal and energy against the church. And he almost, in the spirit of making a promise, said to Joseph, I'll never do that. If I ever leave the church, I will go away, I'll buy an acre of ground somewhere else, I'll never even mention the Mormon church and I'll forget it. The prophet smiled wisely and then said, Brother Behunan, you do not know what you will do. When you enlist to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, you leave neutral ground forever and you can never get back to it. If you leave the church and kingdom of God, it can only be at the instigation of the evil one, and you will submit to him, and you will come to hate me and the saints and even thirst for our blood. Happily, Brother Behunan was faithful to his death. But what Joseph said there became a genuine description of case after case after case. I'll just name a few. William McClellan, to some degree, Thomas B. Marsh, William Law, John C. Bennett. Every one of the prophet's own counselors, with the sole exception of his brother up until the Nauvoo era, betrayed him, went astray, faltered, or failed. Some, glorious to report, found their way back. In the case of Orson Hyde, not a member of the First Presidency, but one of the Twelve, terrible things were said under oath against the Church, of which he later repented. In the case of our first martyr, David W. Patton, the senior member of the Twelve, he too, under the Kirtland fire, became disaffected and then repented. But in his case, so anguished was he in what he had done that he said to the prophet, I have prayed to the Lord and asked if I could give my life to wipe out what I have done. The prophet sorrowed and said, Oh, brother, a man of your faith may receive what he prays for. Brother Patton died in a skirmish in Missouri, you recall. And as the prophet stood over his limp body, he said, There lies a man who has done just what he said he would. He has given his life for the Lord. But many remained livid and bitter in their opposition to the end. I might have lived, Joseph said, 1844, if it were not for a right hand Brutus. And there was more than one. So, the enmity that hurt came from within, and Joseph struggled as the revelation warned him he would, if thou art in perils among false brethren. But that's only the beginning. Let's just speak for a moment of the physical difficulties he faced. We've mentioned the operation early in life. He had a slight limp ever after and as a matter of fact could not be enlisted in the state militia in Missouri because of that injury. When he was on that awful night at the Hiram Johnson home, dragged out and his body bent and twisted by strong men, they left him with back sprains from which he never recovered. He had two large scars on his hip where they had beaten him with the guns over a period of time in a wagon until he had 18-inch bruises. 
He had, as I've mentioned, been poisoned on an occasion, and uh, they tried to poison him at Hiram with aquafortis, and he had clenched his teeth to prevent the vial going in, and one of his teeth became broken. It was never properly cared for, and there was a slight lisp in his speech after that. He more than once faced uh, difficulties with the diseases of the time, but overcame them. And as I mentioned yesterday, even was smitten with cholera on the Zion camp march. In all of this, he struggled both to endure and to overcome. And that is the tension we all face. What must we simply go through? And what, through our faith and worthiness, can we overcome? He was never completely free of physical strains, and again, never really free of the pressures of the presidency. He was in deep water. There were deep cuts and wounds that came to him through life in his own family. You know, for example, that several of his children died and that he speculated, he did not say it was a doctrine of the church, that perhaps some of the choice children born into this world, taken so quickly, were before their birth so noble and so advanced in their relationship with the Lord that the only real remaining need they had from mortality was to take a body. And then the Lord released them. On the other hand, he once observed that he did not like to see a child, anyone's child, die in infancy because they had not yet, as he put it, gained the victory over death, suggesting that eventually, somehow, during or beyond the millennial reign, they would indeed have to face the same basic problems you and I in mortality face. There is, I take it from reading the prophet through and through, no substitute for experience. There is no magic wand that can enable us to become what we are in the ultimate reach to become. Only one way and no shortcuts. About the children, may I observe that a dear mother records the time that the prophet began to borrow in his and Emma's loneliness a little girl, one of another pair of twins, whom he called my little Mary. Mornings he would come just after breakfast, pick up the child, take her home to Emma for most of the day, bring her back in time for dinner. One day the mother decided to play a little trick, and she dressed in exactly the same clothing the twin sister. And as the prophet came to the door, she handed him the other twin. The prophet took a step or two and stopped, turned back and said, Oh no, this is not my little Mary. Many have observed that his love for children was excessive, that he seemed to find his deepest happiness trottling a child on his knee, or helping them across a muddy field, or picking flowers from a carriage and helping them, or wiping their tears. I believe personally that the response of those children, and we have record of many, to him is one of the lasting witnesses of the nobility of his soul. Children are not easily deceived. Many have described how they felt in his presence, how he loved little children. You know, on the same subject of the little ones, he had the problem preaching in Nauvoo, always out of doors because we didn't have an adequate place to meet yet and we're still struggling with the temple. He had the problem of order and decorum. Often people stood to listen. Some were in wagons around and stood up on the benches. And occasionally uh, the younger people, either behind the... Uh, the die or to the side would sit. Occasionally, those charged with order, the ushers and others, would be very severe. And the prophet always chided those who went that far. Let them stay, he would say. They may hear something they will never forget. God bless you, my little man, he said to a boy who was still struggling to get up to four feet high. God bless you you will yet see Israel triumph and in peace. Well, 
Another of his trials in the home related to the sorrows that go with marriage itself and the burdens that Emma had to carry. So often they would just have a moment of peace and there would come the rude shock at the door. Another lawman, another lawlessman, another subpoena, another cry, another warning. Even in Nauvoo, the church well established and to some degree respected, there was a situation where two girls were charged with keeping their eyes open for anyone who came within a block of the house, and then they would rush and say, someone suspicious looking is coming. Sometimes the prophet would literally leave, and sometimes he would hide, and sometimes it would turn out it was a friend who looked disreputable, such as Porter Rockwell. <laughs> and he would scoop up the children and run out and say, now, now, he's not all that bad, is he? Porter Rockwell is one of the colorful characters we cannot any longer, I suspect, disentangle fact from myth in his life. But whatever you may read, remember this statement from Joseph. Brother Porter is an innocent boy, and my soul loves him. Then there were the endless legal entanglements. Brigham Young says Joseph had 48 lawsuits. It is our standard statement that he was acquitted from these. He was in most instances, but in some he was convicted of this or that. There was a charge, for example, in New York that he was guilty of casting out an evil spirit. The trial was held and he was found guilty, as I've said, but the judge then observed that since there was, to his knowledge, no ordinance against that, that he would have to be set free. The charge so often was about the same charge as the ancient Christians faced in the book of Acts. You have set the neighborhood in an uproar. So he had, but how could he help it? Light always stirs up darkness. That is an eternal law. Among those legal trials we find now from some careful study was the last one, a posthumous trial for those involved in what Oaks and Hill call the Carthage Conspiracy. It has always seemed to be symbolic to me that Willard Richards writing to calm the saints after the word has gotten out that Joseph and Hiram have fallen says, in effect, do not make any rash moves. Do not seek vengeance. Leave all of this to the law. And when that fails, leave it to God. Notice, not if it fails. When that fails, leave it to God. It failed. None of those involved at Carthage ever was brought to justice. So be it. In eternity it shall be. The trials extend from the out to the in. I have always felt there was something ironic in the name of the jail, liberty. Of all the places the prophet had none, it was there. Part of the reason he was there was that the salt sermon had been delivered on the prior July 4th in which Sidney Rigdon had said that our enemies were like the salt that had lost its savor and were henceforth good for nothing but to be trodden underfoot. Those were fighting words, and our enemies caught them up quickly. Joseph was blamed and jailed. During those months, and they were the cold winter months, and the one reason he didn't have a blanket is that when he wrote to Emma and pled for one, she had to reply that in his absence, William McClellan had stolen all the blankets from his house. They tried, it's a true story, to feed him on one occasion as a mean joke, uh, human flesh, the amputated limb of a Negro. He had no sanitary facilities except a slop bucket very little light. He wasn't completely alone. His brother was there, but that was in some cases with other visitors an added burden. For as the reports piled up of how our people, 1,500 of them being rousted out of their beds, whipped, beaten, raped, and leaving bloody marks in their footprints on the snow and the charred remains of their crops, all that weighed heavily 
on the soul and the heart of this man. His own trials were one thing. Theirs were another. He played for an answer from the Lord to the two questions. How long wilt thou witness these things and not do something? And the other question, why? Why must the saints suffer so? Well, to the first, the Lord answered that in due time, a generation of vipers would receive their due. But to the second, there was no full answer, except the answer that Job received, and that the Son of Man hath descended below them all. Art thou greater than he? The full explanation of evil is never that we have sinned. The full explanation of evil is that we are sometimes called to go through affliction. In the case of the Missouri saints, they had not fully lived up to their covenants. The Lord made that known to Joseph. And part of what we got, therefore, was deserved. That will not take care of that great remaining sum of man's inhumanity to man. And what happened at Hans Mill was undeserved. Joseph had to learn forbearance, had to learn forgiveness, sometimes aroused in the memory of what he had seen and he did not record all that he saw. He would say, in effect, if ever I am in such a situation, I will help you. I will not say, I can do nothing for you. I can do something for you, and I will. That's an echo of something that was said to him, you remember, in Washington. But he prophesied also at times that there would be repentance and that some who had most hated would become our most beloved. And so it was. Patience he had to learn and pain he had to endure. We can talk then of the spiritual burdens he bore, how he was called over and over again to impose sacrifices on himself and on others when he would rather have not. Situation, Kirtland. Commandment, build a temple. How is the question? Stands here Brigham, stands here Joseph. How will we build the temple? They review the names of everyone they can think of who has ability in construction, and there isn't one member of the church who can do it. Well, says Joseph Young, I know a man up in Canada, excellent in construction. His name is Artemis Millet, but of course he's not a member of the church. At that point, Joseph turns to Brigham. Brigham, I give you a mission. You are to go to Canada. You are to convert Artemis Millet. You are to bring him back to Kirtland with his family and tell him to bring at least $1,000 in cash. But it is the testament of the metal of Brigham that he should say, All right, Joseph, I'll go. Go he did. He converted Artemis Millet and his family. They did come to Kirtland with $1,000. He oversaw the construction of that temple and later the Manti Temple. That's one of the the up-against-the-wall impossibilities, hundreds of them, in the prophet's life, that wrenched his soul and stretched him. Even when he saw secondhand and at a distance what the saints had to bear, he broke into tears and privately went into prayer. Such a case at the Nickerson home in Toronto when he is aware of a young girl named Lydia Bailey has had, at the tender age of 18, two husbands and one child. Both husbands have abandoned her, and the child has died. Why? He goes to the Lord. Why? He called Lydia into a meeting. There was an outpouring of the Spirit. and He made promises to her that out of that affliction there would come into her life such strength as she could not now comprehend. 
and that she had a role to play in the redemption of her family that she could not now fully understand. Those promises came to fulfillment. How he suffered in the witness of how his family suffered. Oh, my father, cried out his oldest son, oh, my father, why can't you stay with us? What are the men going to do with you? And then he was thrust from him by the sword. He cried unto the Lord, Bless my family. The one journal we have that he wrote in his own handwriting over a daily period of time was on that missionary trip up into Canada. And there are two preoccupations. Over and over, the journal turns into a prayer. O oh Lord, bless our testimony that it may seal itself upon the hearts of our hearers and the other. O oh Lord, bless my family. The one day of peace that I can find in the whole documentary history where he comments is where he says simply on one day's entry, took solid comfort with my family. We do have a glimpse of his sleigh riding on an occasion with Alexander. There is record of one Christmas morning when the choir, led by a woman convert from England who was blind, her name was Rushton, came, sang, and awakened him, and he came to the window and said, I thought as you sang that I was hearing the heavenly choir. He was stretched to to do things that he was not, by his own reckoning, fully equipped to do, just in the temporal sense. There is a promise that says, In temporal labors thou shalt not have strength, for this is not thy calling. And yet he was commanded to introduce utopian, and not just dreams, but actual executions utopian schemes in economics, the law of consecration, in politics, the council of fifty, in social thought, plans for communities and their very city design and blockage with the temple at the center. He was, among other things, a city planner. And educationally, the School of the Prophets, the University of Nauvoo, and the instructions that are outlined in sections 88 and 110, rather 109, involving processes for the expansion of the knowledge and power and skill of his faithful band. How could a man be stretched to that? It's one thing to be a spiritual advisor and to bring forth inspiration, but to take a band, a melting pot group of converts from all over the world, and introduce instantly plans for the temporal welfare. And he always taught that you could not totally separate the two, temporal and spiritual. To do that required a man. He had help. The Lord raised up men around him, but he needed all and more. The burden upon me, he said once, is very great. And he kept saying, it is an evidence of the contraction of feeling. He thought this was one of the absolute marks that apostasy had occurred. It is an evidence of the contraction of men's feelings that they are really praying for each other's damnation. So it is. And then he said to the Relief Society, to faithful women, to whom he paid high tribute, but your very emotional makeup tends to make you rigid and judgmental. And he warned them against gossip, warned them against the unruly tongue, said, no, we cannot condone sin, but when men sin, we must make allowance, we must reach out for them. It is an evidence of the love of Christ that we should desire to take them upon our shoulders, perishing souls and carry their burdens ourselves. While so many came to him bearing burdens of sin and pled for him to intervene for them, to help them, that it was as if he bore the burdens of the whole world. And in addition to those, there were those who came and pled for other kinds of help. 
How would it be, for example, to be sound asleep, the door rings, and here stand before you two Negro women? They say that they have traveled over 600 miles, cross lots, daring not to go on the highways lest they should be apprehended. They have escaped from some who had threatened their lives. They are both converts to the church. What can they do? Where can they go? Joseph calls Emma down. Emma, these sisters say they have no place to stay. Is that true, Emma? No, Joseph. They can stay here. Jane, one of the two, stayed the rest of the prophet's life, records what it was like to be involved in the prayers of that family and that she was not a slave and not a servant, but treated as one of the family. Temporal help was cried out for and not just spiritual. Now the prophet had the burden of being a judge, too. He was the mayor of Nauvoo and the head of the legion. That meant discipline as the legionnaire and judgment rendered as the mayor. So Anthony, also a Negro, comes, and what's happened? Well, against the Nauvoo charter, he has been found drunk on the Sabbath to make it worse. What can the prophet do? Pronounces sentence, finds him and tells him to go and take one of the prophet's own horses and sell it to get the money to pay the fine. As for the pressure of love itself, of caring about the saints and wanting them to receive the will of the Lord, he felt often a failure. More than once, the prophet yearned and this is early as the mid-thirties, to simply move into the next world and leave the kingdom in the hands of others. In fact, when he left for the Zion's camp march, he charged Brigham Young. He said, in fact, I command you to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, to bring back his body should he be killed, to be buried by his children in Kirtland. He later said, I had thought when I left that God had required of me all that he would require, but I yet live and there is more for me to do. Again and again, when threatened, and that lots of those threats were empty, and some were not, he exhibited, as I mentioned yesterday, a fearlessness. Someone asked him, how dare you think you are safe in the midst of your enemies. One time he answered that by saying, because the children are praying for me. But another time he said, because I have the promise of God for it, and God cannot lie. There is on record a time when a man came, caught him alone, and shoved a gun right into his sternum and said, Joe Smith, I've got you now and I'm going to kill you. And the prophet unbuttoned his shirt and said, go ahead, shoot, what are you waiting for? And the man instantly dropped the gun, put up his hands, don't shoot! Assuming that there must be somewhere in the room somebody with a bead drawn on him. But the prophet was all alone. Confidence beyond the ordinary, would you say? They're in Missouri. They're lined up. And 1,500 men, by their own scouting reports, are preparing to attack and wipe out every Mormon there. There were about 150 of them and three Jack Mormons. That in those days meant a Mormon sympathizer. Aware of those three, a man came from the mob, flag of truce, and said, we're going to wipe you out, but we understand the three here that aren't Mormons. They can come with us. Well, those three had a little salt in them, and they said, we'll stay, thank you. And then said the prophet Joseph, I give you again the odds, 150 Mormons, many of them young and inexperienced and unarmed, 1,500 in the mob. The prophet said to the leader with the white flag, go back and tell your leader that if he attacks, we will send him and you to help. John Taylor, a witness to that day, said, I thought that was a pretty bold stand to take. <laughs> I consider that the understatement of the 19th century. The man went back and the militia withdrew.
call that what you will, courage, faith, and endurance. Somewhere, Edward Hunter, who became the first presiding bishop, records of how they're in hiding in a little attic, and that house still stands in Nauvoo. I say little because they couldn't even stand up. They went out through a trap door, but then they were over the rafters, of course, and, and the roof, so they had to sort of double down and sit. They were there often many hours. In exactly that setting, by the way, the prophet wrote section 128 of the Doctrine and Covenants. A rhapsody. The one that begins, let the mountains shout for joy. In an attic. In a shack. But in that same attic, he said to Edward Hunter one day, I know, I know what brought you into the church, and you can do much good. And you are akin to me, and I know your genealogy. Well, the sheer separation from his loved ones, the inability to speak, which he met by writing, the cooped-up feeling, which because of his spontaneity and makeup he despised, all those things compounded to make life difficult. And yet, as I've just said, he could write inspired, rejoicing literature. Brethren, shall we not go forward in such a cause? Forward, brethren. He was not discouraged. When he asked for peace of soul in moments of great anguish, he, like us, did not always receive the Lord's full explanation. The demand that the Lord explain to us in detail why it is necessary for this or that, that demand takes us a step beyond genuine faith. If we are close enough to the Lord and if we have the assurance that we are filling our missions as appointed, it should not come as any great shock or surprise that we should walk in affliction. That's the program. That's what we came in a measure to face and to endure in righteousness. He, instead of being given answers by way of explanation, was simply given assurance, the whisper of peace, the be still, Joseph, and know that I am God. Or again, the serenity that does not assure you anything by way of where am I exactly, where am I going, but only you're on track. Murmur not. All will work out in the end. Well, the prophet had to endure and not know when. He had premonitions over and over. He said things like, can I borrow that book? I was at the home of Edward L. Stevenson in Pontiac, Michigan, early 1930s. Here is a book called Fox's Book of the Martyrs. He takes it. When he returned it to Mother Stevenson in Missouri, he said, I have prayed about those old martyrs. These were men and women who had literally given their blood and lives in the testimony of Jesus. Various faiths, backgrounds, but their conviction meant death. He read it and said, I've prayed about them. And they were good men according to the light they received. And God has a salvation for them. Question, why would he have been preoccupied with that? Answer, my guess is that he anticipated he would be numbered among them. Again and again, as I've told you, he had promises that his life would be prolonged to fill a certain mission. Thy days are known, he was told in Liberty Jail, and thy years shall not be numbered less. What is that, a statement of fatalism? 
No, for we learn that in conversations with Brother Brigham, Brother White and his own mother, he confided that exactly what he was told was, if, note the conditional, if he would hearken to the voice of the Spirit, he had about five years. We now know that that revelation was given late in March, 1839. When was he shot at Carthage? June, 1844. Five years and two months. If you will study the last two months, there was an urgency which in our day would be called a sense of living on borrowed time. When he laid upon the twelve the burdens he had carried in late March, 1844, their journals uniformly say that he rejoiced exceedingly and said, Thank God I have lived to see this day. Now it doesn't matter what happens to me. He did not fear death. He anticipated it. But he kept saying that he yearned to give his life in a way that would matter. There was a moment recorded by Benjamin Johnson when, on a Sunday, a beautiful day, they're sitting in the living room and down came three of his children, freshly bathed, Sunday clothing. He embraced them and then said to Benjamin, Oh, look at these children. How could I help loving the mother of such children? Why, I would go to hell for such a woman. There is the truth about the legend. Joseph Smith, so far as I can make out, never said, A, Emma is going to hell. B, I'm going to go dig her out. He said, I would go to hell for such a woman. Meaning, this is how strongly I feel toward my wife. Do you see the distinction? Then he said to Benjamin something about other children, and they had had a joint experience where he had blessed 26 in a row and had sensed what they would face in the trials of life and had concentrated his faith to seal upon them a blessing and was so weary when he was finished. Jedediah Grant said he turned pale that he sank into a chair. He said to Benjamin, Oh, I get so tired and yearn for my rest. And Benjamin Johnson said, Oh, Joseph, what would we do without you? And the prophet replied, Benjamin, I would be engaged in the work beyond the veil with the greater power than I have here. Well, the presentiments that it would not be long were heavy upon him. The prophet had two added burdens of which we have rarely spoken. Mosiah Hancock, the young son of Levi Hancock, the prophet's bodyguard, one of many who struggled to protect, was in a meeting where the prophet, you remember, drew a sword and heard him say, I will not submit any longer to cursed mobocracy. I would rather die. I would rather my blood flow. Inspired as a mere boy with the loyalty that Levi Hancock had to the prophet, for he had that day put his hand down in the midst of the Nauvoo Legion and said, Here is a man whom the Lord has revealed to me would give his life for me. The boy went home and said to his father, I hope I can be as loyal to the prophet's son as you are to the prophet. Said Levi Hancock to Mosiah, No, my son, you must not be, for the Lord has made known to Joseph that his son will lead away a portion of the saints. Of all the burdens a patriarch would have to bear in his last days, the burden of knowing of such a division in his own family and in the kingdom he was living and dying to establish, 
must have cut the deepest. Emma, he said, according to one account that last morning, can you train my sons to walk in their father's footsteps? She replied, oh, Joseph, you're coming back. She couldn't believe he wasn't. He always had before. Emma, he repeated the same question. Joseph, you're coming back. And a third time. He left with such reticence that in one account we read he went all the way back a third time to say goodbye to his children. May we catch the vision of enduring and overcoming trials. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.